Hey everyone, I'm here with a very special guest today. His name is Mariano and he's the CEO of Mural. Hey Mariano. Hello Carlos, thank you for the invitation. And it's a, uh, hopefully people understand our English as a second language with some very uh, Latin tint to it. I think that's one of the reasons why you and I connected and go way back. Um, I'd love to learn more about your story on how you kind of came up with Mural and then how you think about the future. So let's start from the very beginning. What was kind of the, the main problem that 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 each that you wanted to scratch? Sure. It was 10 years ago. We we're, were going through a 10-year anniversary situation, which makes you like, oh, humble, right? So these things take a lot of time. And 10 years ago, we had a video games company that we sold to a company called Playdom and then to Disney. So we were working for Disney. We had a video a game on social game on Facebook and Orchid back then, soccer game, 2010 World Cup. Uh, we had like 1 million players per month, super popular. So I had to design the new game. And I wanted to do a game about emotions, about colors. Uh, the game would change depending on what people were feeling and expressing their feelings on social media. These, these creatures, these characters, choreographies. And I was using a PowerPoint deck to basically collect stuff on characters, on storyline, on mechanics, and so forth. Because I was flying back and forth from Argentina to the Bay Area. And I needed something digital to have some portability on my ideas, right? To share around. And way back when the options were not as many. And I realized that when I, I was sharing work in progress with people with no structure, I was like going through slides forwards and backwards and people were confused on one end. I was also confused. I didn't know what I'm starting like building on the idea. And the other thing is that when I was opening up a PowerPoint deck and showing it to people, People were uh, expecting either getting informed on something final or evaluate that thing. Like, no, your idea is the mediocre. Instead of like co-creating shoulder to shoulder, like I had experience inside a room with a whiteboard together and so forth, which is feels more draft, more approachable. And the, there's affordance to change stuff. It's not permanent, it's not done. It's not a version 1.0. It's like in progress, right? So that was the original insight. And, I, and we started and I took a very bad decision to make it very horizontal, very open-ended instead of focusing. The only thing that I give advice to early stage entrepreneurs right now is like, who are your 10 happy customers that look and walk and sound the same? That's, that's all you should care about in the beginning. Instead, I had like a million people per, per day in the World Cup, I had my ego was big. This is for everyone. And no, it might be eventually for everyone, but right now or back then, not really. So we had to struggle and row. And also the other reality is like the market wasn't there. Put aside remote work for a second, right? So that's evident now through the pandemic, remote or digital first collaboration proof that we don't need proof, right? We had the whole world go like that. The interesting thing that we support, though, is that a type of remote work, which is like the core innovation, strategy, planning, reflection, team building. So things that are like cognitively challenging and would generally happen all together inside a project room in customer engagements, right? So what we've seen in the last 10 years, and product school is one example of this, is like there's been an improvement in know-how in frameworks, visual frameworks to help you think, to help you collaborate. That, that again, in a way, 10 years ago, people knew what a PNL was, right? But not so much what a no, business model design or customer journey map or many other or prioritization grids that help us operate as innovators, right? Yeah. So that was, that's, that's how we grew this thing and of course the enterprise component but the original insight was something around the affordance of the medium like what's crazy to me is that first of all this is a 10-year overnight success so as i've been talking about remote work and collaboration for a while in a world where kind of the only option was powerpoint 
or keynote, you name it, but it was very, very sequential, right? And so when you create a, an open canvas, which is, as you said, for everyone, who were those early adopters, people who really found value at the very beginning? Yeah, so I always tell this story to new people that we hire because again, it's, it, 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 it's hard to remember. But again, in the beginning, we took a, a bad decision that we, we let it be for everything. So we had a lot of consumer type use cases, right? Trip planning or, you know, uh, home refurbishing or I don't know, some scrapbooking. And, and we, all, we saw usage go like high and then kabloom dropped. Then we saw certain groups staying and generally there was frequent collaboration. And in particular, this group from Steelcase, the furniture company that used to be an, or maybe still is an owner of IDEO, the design firm, and a group inside IDEO, which was focusing on uh, solutions for the workplace, right? So we saw them in our stats and, and we reached out to them to understand better. And we realized that they were not just taking advantage of the open space that the whiteboard provided or the flexible canvas, but they were adding some methodology to it. Like they were not just randomly adding thoughts. They were constructing a journey map. They were putting some uh, prioritization. They were like synthesizing user research, right? So they were, they were using it for the methodologies, not for the malleability of the whiteboard. It's not, they were not drawing pictures of cats or other things, right? They were building frameworks. So alignment diagrams to help them understand or, or share ideas with each other. And they were following a procedure, right? So first we do this, then we do that and so forth. So then we say, okay, we need to be for teams that care about, in this case, design thinking, right? That, that was like what we learned way back when. So that was the first zoom in, right? So teams, that yes, need a whiteboard, but in particular, practice some form of structure methodology. Immediately after that, like three months later, we got an introduction from Phil, sorry, Tim Brown, former CEO at IDEO, to Phil Gilbert, now former general manager for design at IBM. And design groups in some companies are in charge of, of course, bringing in designers, teaching them the way of product management, teaching the way of design thinking and so forth, but also helping the rest of the company uh, build, like remove the antibodies for good product design, right? Like embrace design, understand how a designer thinks, works and so forth, and introduce that for sales, for marketing, for HR, to do an you know, employee experience design or I mean, customer yeah. engagements, right? I mean, I'm not a designer. And I, one of the reasons why I came across Mural was because I was looking for a visual way to communicate with designers and other stakeholders. And, and for me, what was really powerful is that I was able to do so without opening an instructions book, you know? Yeah, so what we talk about imagination a lot, right? So imagination work and visualization of imagination because we believe that anybody that has a brain uses imagination. They might forget at school, they might forget at work, but this colorful, powerful thing that we have in here allows us to see the world in a new way, and then we can take action to do something about it. But imagination is needed and visualization to then go and do creation, right? So actually building a thing, could be physical, could be interactive, could be UI, but that's where the collaboration between business people, product people and designers should happen. And then of course, designers and engineers can help you build a beautifully crafted interactive experience that fulfills the original need it was absurd through uh, user research, imagination, and so on. So I can see how some curious people out there kind of find this tool and start creating something. But like, guide me through that moment where you are elevating this beyond just a product, beyond just a set of features and even methodologies to drive change at an enterprise level. Yeah, something that I joke around with my salespeople at times, like, guys, we don't sell tools. If you want to get a tool, go to Home Depot. Right? So there is a series of tools inside our software. It's, it's an online whiteboard. There's a set of features also facilitation superpower features to help you run the meetings. But ultimately what people are trying to do is like, of course, run through a workflow, 
but also improve how they do the workflow consistently after that, right? So we believe that the only way to do that, besides having the software, is to introduce methodologies and templates for those methodologies. And on top of that, to be honest with you, an interaction with some sort of expert or coach that helps them practice, right? Facilitators on demand or folks like you in your community that can be there for them to prepare for that workflow to happen, to run the meetings that need to happen for that workflow to happen and coach them along the way. Because it's hard, right? It's hard to run a good I know, product strategy session or a good user feedback session or a design sprint. It's, it's not an easy workflow. Totally, and also I'm thinking that there are some companies that they were working in person, right? And they were pretty big. Some of them don't even know each other. So for them, kind of how do you go about making sure that they embrace this new way of work, this new way of collaborate, different than maybe a, a new startup who's already working remotely and everyone is very tech savvy? Well, the last year they didn't have an option, right? So it's like they had to adapt really fast and there was a lot of anxiety and people were super nervous. So our support and customer success teams like were like helping people all the time. So, but, that, but then I think that the beautiful thing about this global weird experiment that we went through what we're in some parts of the world we're still going through is that again, it forced us to think about how we use time and how we design time, right? Like we, the, the facilities part or the in-person stuff, great. But even in the office, like most of the time, again, besides commuting, but we're not necessarily like taking advantage of being around other people. Or if we are in the meeting, we're not asking the right questions, remembering the right prompts, time boxing to make sure that we wrap in time, evaluate the meeting and proof for the next one, right? So I think that the nice thing that's happening right now is that people are self-aware on how to use time because they were feeling exhausted by talking to a screen multiple times per day and long hours. So we're seeing like shrinking off together time and doing more asynchronous work. People are starting to experiment with these things. And the extra thing that is happening is people are trying things to solve for these problems. Like for example, ice breaking exercises to open up meetings. Asking, I do this with my leadership team, asking how people are feeling when we open up a meeting. Because if someone like has like a headache or depression or going through some personal thing, it's hard to like expect a lot from that person in that event. And we can be tolerant with each other in that situation. So the nice thing also is that people are practicing, reacting to them, practicing over and over because they're digital. It's relatively easier to set up a room digitally. It's there, it's templates. And the other thing, they're digital, they're copyable. I mean, I like what you mentioned about creating that type of trust and, and being vulnerable, talking about feelings. Like, how can you kind of create that type of connection in an environment where people can't really touch each other? So, of course, we are human beings. We like being the fireside, a virtual fireside chat right here. Ideally, we'll be all together and we have some nice jamón de bellota, cut it, have a piece, share, cut some bread with tomate. Yeah, that would be ideal. Or maybe not. I mean, it's ideal every once in a while, right? So I always think of like online guilds in games, right? So World of Warcraft way back when, League of Legends and so forth, where people build relationships through these games and they build trust. They have a common objective. They wipe their other teams out. And sometimes if people don't know their real names, their real faces or anything, but there is a level of trust and so forth. So I truly believe in play, like scripted, guided games, a series of prompts, questions, activities that prompt people to this. Even I would argue that if we were next time getting together with a bunch of the Spanish community in the Bay Area and you put together a piece of ham and so forth, I would also encourage you to design the meeting so that not only the extroverts can socialize with each other, but also introverts. And maybe have a prompt or maybe have a moment in which, I don't know, 
you're guiding the conversation so that people don't need to necessarily small talk to know someone new, meet someone new, put a body system in place or whatever it is. But it's about designing the game that are our meetings. Love that. And, and I think that there's a lot of benefits in that gaming culture. My, my mom used to hate me for, for playing too many video games, but I think I was able to create an argument to say, hey, now I'm, I think there's a way to make work fun, to gamify the way we collaborate and, and connect with each other. And you've obviously been able to prove it. Like uh, for people who might not be aware of the scale of Mura, you you guys are part of a unicorn club. Maybe you can, can you share any other stats about like maybe companies or like the, the status of, of your company? By the way, before you go there, uh, when we were in the video games uh, industry, like around 2007 or eight, there was a Harvard Business Press book around the gamer generation and how the gamer generation, well, of course was growing up. So becoming like more re relevant in, in, in business. And there were things around controlled uh, risk-taking, right? Because you're repeating um, like procedurally levels all the time and you're trying to like make a change, make a change. And it's okay to fail, right? Because in worst case scenario, you start over. So there's a lot of things that happen to our brains because of playing so many games that are, some are positive. None. There's some addictions and so forth, but most of them are, well, a lot of them are positive. So coming back to your question, we've been fortunate to be a, in a position that we were already ready to support large enterprises in deploying this new way of working, right? Before the pandemic, we had in published IBM as a big customer. We did a total economic impact report with them in February 2018, being a customer for a lot of years already, and many others that we've shared in our website and, and you can check out. So we already prepared for this. This is not new for us. The only thing that happens is like it's big all of a sudden, right? So the deployments are bigger, and it's a CIO thing too. Um, everybody, everybody needed it, or in some shape or form, right? So it's like a bigger deployments. So with that, I mean, the last year has been intense, and um, yeah, we have people many places all around the world. We like to hire people that are mission and culture aligned. So in general, we have like a adaptable and growing culture that's it's it's working well. It's not the point, right? The point is that we have a lot of very happy customers, uh, tens of thousands of people in our biggest customers. That means that it's not just product managers, it's not just designers. It's people in different parts of the organization that want to think like a designer, that want to think like a product manager, and in, want to introduce these methodologies to run their businesses. Right? I, I, the other day I was talking to our, our head of legal and she was being, again, she, she's doing a lot of things as you can imagine. And I told her, hold on, why don't you think about legal, the service as a product that you have certain features? Like you can deliver, I don't know, three contract reviews per day. The feature, is, I mean, the, the system doesn't allow more for that. Or no, you cannot hire people in this other country. It's a feature, like it's a, it's a level of service. And if you don't have that level of service, maybe you can plug in an integration. So anyway. Um, and are you saying that attorneys are using Mura? Because this just blew up my mind. Oh, yeah. The, 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 <laughs> the other day, I, I received a note from someone as a, at a very large consumer package goods that creates chocolates and coffee, a procurement guy that it was like, I'm in love with Mura. That I run a workshop with 100 people, procurement in India. Excellent. Okay, so you said you've been, I mean, some of the things that we are seeing now are not really new. You've been talking about them and, and use and, and now what does the next year look like for the future of work? Like like if, if we were to record this and then play it again a few years from now, what are some of those predictions? So remember, I mean, I, I, I'm not a, so we, we support remote work, of course, but the type of remote work that we support is a particular type, right? So we don't do, I don't know, video calling, we don't do task management, you do, we don't do chat, right? So there's there's many components to the tooling around digital workplace. And there's been many predictions around that and probably like the one, the biggest one is like, it's here to stay. Digital first is here to stay. Why? Because it was already here before. I mean, I mean the, especially large companies, right? Large companies had people in different offices. The moment they have people in different offices, you're working digitally, right? But
cognitive, very hard to do because there's a lot of trust building to be done and so forth around strategy, planning, innovation, team reflection, team building, customer engagements. That before the pandemic, especially sales, for example, to do workshop with their clients, they fly because I mean the ROI was there. But then they realized, hey, it's not needed, at least not all the time, right? They were able to do these very intimate customer engagements remotely and deploy that money, give it back to their customers or whatever, savings in TNE, put them into more services. So the point is like, people got confident that they can do a lot of this work remotely. And there are some others that did not last year, but those others, they know last year, again, might take a little more time, but we'll end up there. Why? Because they're gonna to go to workshop and one key team member won't be able to be there. We should have done this on a digital format so that such and such that had this issue with the kids could participate. If not, we have to do a redo a week from now. So the malleability, the resiliency that, that, that digital gives you is why, why would you give that away? Now, it's not about the resiliency, it's not about the asynchronicity, it's not about using time more effectively so that when you get into the together time, you don't need eight hours of work because you have done some work before the session, like when the flipped classroom in schools were invented, where you read by yourself, you watch by yourself, and then you take advantage of project work when you get together. It's not just about that, it's about doing it better. It's about doing by like following the game because someone has spent the time to design a good game and just play the game. And then you can tweak the game to work on your favor, right? Because there's, each team has their own particularities, right? But the, 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 my, my opinion recorded is like, A, digital first won't go away. B, asynchronous will be as important as synchronous work. And C, which is the one that I care the most about is like best practices coined as games or whatever you wanna call them. And methods that are common in design being deployed company wide and as known as a PNF. I, mean, I share your vision and optimism for obviously bringing everyone up to speed on the imagination cloud, as you call it. Now I see also um, kind of an opportunity, which is, okay, even though your product is really broad and covers a bunch of use cases, you also mention others, right? The video calls or task management, and I'm sure there are tons of others. How do you go about building, but also integrating with others? Yeah, so there's, of course, like, as I said, like there's a tooling component and there's like the asynchronicity to the digital first, you need a bunch of, of software to work together. So work management, video, chat, and, and it, it needs to be all there so it can be stitched together with synchronic, asynchronic, synchronic, asynchronic, synchronic, asynchronic, to uh, multiple people, solo work, right? That combination of, of things need to happen to accomplish a workflow. You don't do strategic planning just in a second, right? Like there's people preparing data, there's a report, you need a report, there's a divergence, convergence, maybe follow up again, another divergence, convergence, decision, we go. And then we need to communicate the thing to the rest of the company. So it's like a long thing, it's not just planning, but planning and sharing and reviewing and so forth. So all of that, there's a set of tooling that needs to get better. And we are investing super hard on getting better at integrating with, and we're doing, we're now something with Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Slack is an investor, we're doing more there, Jira is. So there's many things on the software tooling side. But the most important one, to be honest with you, Carlos, and again, I, I'm throwing some, some flowers at you now. It's like, it's the people with the games. In the game, we call them like game masters or playmakers, right? Like Dungeons and Dragons, you need the game, the rules of play. Someone designed Dungeons and Dragons, really good game. I'm not very fond of it because it's too demanding for me. But Dungeons and Dragons, without the role of the game master, we call them playmakers or facilitators, not going to happen. Yeah. Right, so the integration with the community that has the games and has the community to help people run the games, that's super important. So I'm looking forward to getting the feedback from people on the collaboration that we're doing on the Prox School content on top of Miro. Product managers are perfect fit for also playing the role of the playmaker. 
And I'm sure that a lot of them right now getting excited, thinking, okay, this is really cool, but you know, my CEO doesn't see it or my company is too big. I'm not, the, I'm not calling the shots. What would be kind of like a, how can we, they get a, a quick win? How can they help at least adopt some of these best practices so other members of the team can get value right away without having to overescalate this to the CFO to sign a big contract? Well, our model allows for that, right? Um, you can get started by picking up the thing, especially if you are part of the product school community, you can ask someone to ask someone to get you sorted. Uh, and the reality is like, yeah, we have like this set up a have moment and habit building moment in our onboarding our growth model. And the reality is like, we always, I would say to people like, recurring revenue comes after recurring impact and comes after recurring onboarding, right? So I'm here and as a company, we want to make money in the long run, right? We are long-term really like the Qualtrics people say. So right now it's like, we need to like have form formation. So we are changing our pricing and packaging to allow for removing all friction in the beginning when it comes to financials to make sure that you go to that aha moment and uh, have it formation. Because in our software, what it's hard is like, we have a lot of people that come into Mural on board properly, super happy. Some of you start paying and then they drop and they tell, oh, the project ended. It's like, it's not that the project, we didn't do a good job of showing all of the other use cases they can use Mural for. Right? So we're getting better at that. And with that, we want to like give patience to our, 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 our folks so that then it can be the business case. Then once you use this uh, three, four times per month as a team, we care about weekly active deep work, week once per week deep. It's really easy to make a business case to CFO, right? Like the IBM total economic impact report has like a bunch of vectors to do an narrow value case. After like a bunch of, it's a no brain. I mean, the, but of course, like we need to like, have like recurring impact first. The recurring revenue after that's peanuts on the dollar. Thank you for being on the show, dreaming big with us. Uh, it's really fascinating to follow your journey. I remember many years ago when we met and we were talking about some of There's these. There's a lot of like rowing the boat, rowing the boat. <laughs> turbo. Well, let's keep building the future. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Mariano. Cheers.